the book of Isaiah, chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And now Daryl has um, the sermon. And the message is entitled, The Signs of Christmas. Well, that's all right as long as we, we have a meal after. and So let's begin. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath day. We want to thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We all have a lot to be thankful for. Dorothy Selleck has a lot to be thankful for. And there's many others here that have a lot to be thankful for. And we ask you, Lord, to speak through me, speak this message to your people, through me today, I pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, the title of the message is obviously, Elaine's already mentioned it, The Signs of Christmas. Do we see the signs of Christmas around us today? Here in the church, we see things that are symbolic of Christmas. The poinsettias, the candles on the side windows. The nativity. The nativity. That's the true, truer sign of what Christmas is all about. But what are the signs of Christmas, you know? Christmas lights appearing in front of houses, that's one of the signs. Christmas tree lots appearing in the community, and we've seen Christmas tree lots in Amherst, suddenly appearing. Christmas decorations appearing in the stores. Christmas parades happening in many of our communities. Santa Claus appearing on those parades and, and in the shopping centers. Christmas movies on TV. Christmas music on the radio and in the stores and the list goes on and on and on and on. But what's missing? What's missing? Christ, Christ is missing. What kind of message is the Christmas music making that we hear today? What's the focus? Santa Claus is coming to town, right? And you all know the song. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Is that the type of Christmas that we want to be, want to be remembering? Is, you know, nothing wrong with decorations and things like that. But we need, I'm glad that that's not the only songs that we hear though because there's, there's the other kind of Christmas music, such as what we sang in our opening hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sang, Sing, and Silent Night that we just sang as, as well. These are the time, type of songs that we need to be hearing in our communities. But even though also I heard this kind of Christmas music, I still didn't understand it. I didn't understand Silent Night, Holy Night, Christ the Savior is born. I didn't understand Hark the angel, Herald Angels Sing in the sense, in the real sense of Christmas. My focus as a young child was on Santa Claus. Santa Claus is coming to town. I get all excited on that, but you know something? That's nothing compared to the real meaning of Christmas. You know, because I understood the wrong meaning of Christmas before I discovered and then understood the true meaning of Christmas. But what is the true meaning of Christmas? Actually, the true meaning of Christmas was so distorted that they didn't even know the time of the year that Christ was born in that manger in Bethlehem on that great and glorious day, which definitely wasn't on December the 25th. The true meaning of Christmas should have been about the first coming of Jesus Christ. How many were preparing for the first coming of Jesus Christ? How many of them knew how he was supposed to come even? How many people are preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ? And how many people know how he is supposed to come the second time? It's interesting, as the world is not and will, will not be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ, as his own chosen people were not 
prepared for his first coming. One thing the devil was successful at doing was his work of deceiving the people, beginning with deceiving a third of the angels, then deceiving Eve, and then also using Eve to get to Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. And his deceptions continued on and on in the manner of Christ's first coming, and then also the deception in the manner of Christ's second coming. So what are the true signs of Christmas? The true signs of Christmas. And what were the true signs of that first Christmas day? What was the true manner of Christ's first coming that God's so-called chosen people missed? Didn't God tell them in advance how the Messiah was to come, how the Christ child was, how Christ was to come? Really, the Christ child. Some scholars believe that there are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And these prophecies are specific enough that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them, let alone all of them, is staggeringly improbable, if not impossible. It would have been impossible if it hadn't been of God in the first place. With God, nothing is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And we're going to look at only a few of these prophecies this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. One such prophecy is found in Isaiah 7, verse 14, which was the scripture reading regarding the manner of his birth. And you should see it on the screen there? Yeah, it's looking, looking pretty clear. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So what was the sign that Isaiah prophesied? That a what? A virgin would conceive and give birth to the Messiah or to Emmanuel. So what was the chance of a virgin giving birth to a child? What's the chance of a virgin giving birth to a child today? No chance at all, is there? No chance at all. But with God, it was a 100% chance. Because God was in it. It was a prophecy uttered by God. And God fulfills all his prophecies. Because this prophecy was fulfilled in Luke 1 verse 31. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. And this was spoken by, to Mary by the angel Gabriel. And in response to this, Mary responds to the angel in verse 34. And this is what Mary said. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Seeing that I'm not married. Seeing that I am a virgin. That's basically what she was saying. And verse 35 says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come on you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit was directly involved in the virgin birth of the Son of God. And with God, nothing is impossible. In the prophecy of Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7 verse 14 was fulfilled. Though Joseph was a righteous man and knew that the law required such persons as he supposed his wife to be should be put to death, yet as righteousness is ever directed by mercy, he determined to put, away, to put her away or divorce her privately without assigning any cause that her life might be saved. And as the offense was against himself, he had a right to pass it by if he chose, and he so chose. Mary had obviously told Joseph what had happened. However, he obviously didn't believe her until after the dream that he had received from the angel of the Lord, who said to Joseph in Matthew 1, verses 20 and 21, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It was prophesied where he would be born. And I don't think you can see that very well on the screen. So I'm going to put it up here. Bethlehem. 
Micah 5 verse 2, Bethlehem, out of you shall he come forth to me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah prophesies that Christ the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. We find the fulfillment that Christ was born in Bethlehem in Matthew 2 verse 1, where it states where Christ was actually born in fulfillment of the prophecy made by Micah. And this is what it says. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, note that, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Of course, this verse is in connection to the visitation by the wise men. Verse 2 says, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. So where did he ask this question? He went to Jerusalem, and he asked this question. And what was the reaction to this question being asked of the people in Jerusalem? Matthew 2 verse 3 says, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. It says that Herod was troubled. But why was Herod troubled? Why wouldn't he be excited over, over this? Why was he troubled? It was an eye problem. He had an eye problem. It appears that Herod at this time gathered the whole Sanhedrin in order to get the fullest information on a subject by which all his jealous fears had been alarmed. The child, this child, posed a threat to the throne of Israel, posed a threat to Herod. The worst thing was that until the wise men asked the question, where is he that is born king of the Jews, they were all completely in the dark about what had happened. And where it, ha where it had happened, and even when it had happened. At the time of Christ's first advent, the priests and scribes of the holy city to whom were entrusted the oracles of God might have discerned the signs of the times and proclaimed the coming of the promised one. They should have known. They should have known. The prophecy of Micah designated his birthplace. Daniel specified the time of his advent in Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27 in connection with the 70 week prophecy, which we won't take the time to go over again seeing that we had covered that prophecy previously. God had committed these prophecies to the Jewish leaders. They were without excuse if they did not know and declare to the people that the Messiah's coming was at hand. So they did not know. The people were not looking for the Messiah. You know something? How many people are looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ in the world today? No, they're looking forward to Santa Claus on Christmas Day. Having received their answer, the, the wise men, and, they, and seeing the star once again, they went their way to Bethlehem and went to the house, not the stable, to where they were now residing. You know, they were not, no longer residing in the stable. How long do you think it took the wise men to travel from the east? It would obviously took a bit of time, about two years, you're right. From the very first time they saw the star, to travel from the east of Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, so there was no way they could have found him still in a manger. He would have been almost two years old. Can you imagine him spending two years in the manger? That would not make any sense at all. And yet, the Christmas story the world has, has him visiting the Christ child in a manger. The three wise men visiting in the manger rather than in the house. Matthew 2 verse 11 says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child, not a baby anymore, but a young child, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So what did they enter into? A house. And did they see the baby in a manger? No. They saw the young child in a house. And what did they do? What did they do? They fell down and worshipped him. And then what did they do? They presented to him their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And there was a reason for these gifts. These gifts were really needed by Mary and Joseph. Right? We'll talk about that maybe one other time. Getting back to Herod and the Sanhedrin. 
Their ignorance was the result of sinful neglect. They should have known better, but they weren't even aware of it until the question had been asked by the foreigners, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The scene that unfolds in Herod's palace when the wise men arrive is tragic. Outsiders discovered that those who had been given the gift of God's covenant were not only ignorant of the prophecies they had found so thrilling, but personally threatened by the arrival of the long-awaited king of heaven. Before the story is over, God has to warn them in a dream not to return to the palace. So they departed and went home another way. You know, they didn't even know of his birth, the place of his birth and the time of his birth. And I find it interesting that the exact year and exact date of his birth is not known, which makes sense, really, when you think of it, as the exact year and day of his second coming is also not known. Right? So what would have happened if they knew the exact day and year of his birth? What would they have done? They would have idolized that day, probably. Anyway, but there is a group, one group of people, though, who knew the exact day of the birth of Christ. And who do you, do you know who they were? Shepherds. The shepherds, right? And if you can make out the picture on the screen, then yes, you will know that they were the shepherds who were keeping watch over their sheep. Luke 2 verse 8 says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping over their flock by night. Flock of sheep. I never realized you called sheep flocks. Flock of geese, but flock of sheep? I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> anyway, what happened next? Verse, 20, verse 9 says, and, and uh, says, And see, the angel of the Lord came on them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. They were sore afraid. Luke, verse 10 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Verse 11, and the angel said to them, I think I read that one already. Yes. Come on here, computer, you're slowing down. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So for, for to you is born what day? This very day, right? In, this, in the city of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What day? This day, this very day. So the shepherds knew the day of his birth. We don't know what that day was. However, the shepherds definitely knew. The shepherds definitely knew when the first coming of Christ took place. Just as there are going to be the some, some of God's people who will definitely know what the day of the second coming of Jesus Christ will, will be. But not until that day is on the verge of happening. You know, nobody knew. Only the shepherds knew. But guess what? It's not captured in the scriptures. On purpose, I believe. On purpose. And what was the sign that the first coming of Jesus had taken place? Verse 13 says, And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So the shepherds were given a sign, which was that they find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. Couldn't get a better sign than that. And then what happened? The star. The star of Bethlehem. You know? They, the wise men were the ones to notice that star, but nobody else noticed that star. You know? It should be carefully noted, again, that it was outsiders who seemed more excited by the birth of Christ. Humble shepherds received the first announcement ahead of the dignitaries in Jerusalem. And wise men from the east, foreigners, seemed more attuned to the nuances of Bible prophecy than those to whom the prophecies had been given. Very interesting, isn't it? The shepherds were probably the only ones who knew about the first coming of Jesus Christ on the exact day that it happened. And were probably the first ones to go and see it for themselves. The ones who should have known, the religious leaders, didn't know what was happening until about two years later when the wise men arrived from their long journey. And what about the people in the world today? 
what about the people in the world today? How many of them know the signs or prophecies pertaining to the first coming of Christ? And how many people in the world, and even in the church, know the signs or prophecies pertaining to the second coming of Christ? My prayer is that we will use the opportunity we have during the Christmas season to promote the true meaning of that very first Christmas and the signs that were revealed to them back then and the prophecies regarding the first coming of Jesus Christ. My prayer is also that we will also use this opportunity to proclaim the message of the three angels in relation to all the prophecies regarding the soon come, second coming of Jesus Christ. So let us pray before we have our closing hymn. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for, for the fact that we know here in this church, we know here in this church today, the true meaning of Christmas. We know that, was all, that, that the real, real true meaning of Christmas, that first Noel that we sing about too, that is all about Jesus. It's not about anything else. It's all about Jesus coming to save this world from their sins. He came, he became flesh and dwelt among us to save us because he loves us. And he wants us to be where he is. So dear Heavenly Father, be with us, Lord. Help us to proclaim the real true meaning of the Christmas season. Help us to take this opportunity that we have to proclaim the first coming of Jesus, that that's what Christmas was all about. And then also to proclaim the second coming of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. So be with each and every one of us here now, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.